Welcome to the History Guy podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. We at the History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and the History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join the History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with the History Guy, looks behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at thehistoryguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. Most people know about the U.S. Mints in Philadelphia and Denver. On today's episode, the History Guy talks about America's forgotten mints. First, he talks about the numerous mints that dotted the American frontier, from Georgia to Louisiana to Nevada. Then, he takes us across the Pacific to the only American mint built on foreign soil, the mint in Manila, capital of the Philippines. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. Most people are familiar with the mint marks on U.S. coins, blank or P for the Philadelphia Mint, D for the Denver Mint. Less commonly, you see the S for the San Francisco Mint, and we still operate a mint at West Point, which uses the mint mark W. But fewer people are familiar with the fact that, for example, the Denver Mint was not the first U.S. Mint to use the D mint mark, or the story of the many other mints that the U.S. Treasury Department has historically operated in the United States, each of which is intimately entwined with the history of the city in which they were built and the American frontier. The story of America's forgotten mints deserves to be remembered. Congress passed the Coinage Act on April 2, 1792, establishing the first national mint. Under the Articles of Confederation, the states themselves were authorized to mint their own currency, but following the ratification of the Constitution, it became imperative for the country to create a national coinage. This effort was spearheaded in part by Washington Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. As he wrote in his 1791 report to Congress, a nation ought not to suffer the value of the property of its citizens to fluctuate with the fluctuations of a foreign mint. The act also required that each coin feature an impression emblematic of liberty and several denominations not in common use today, the quarter eagle worth $2.50, the half eagle worth $5, and the eagle worth $10. Congress chose Philadelphia, then the U.S. Capitol, as the location of the first mint, and President Washington chose David Rittenhouse, a renowned American scientist, to direct it. The mint was the first federal building erected under the Constitution, and the building was eventually emblazoned with the words, Ye Old Mint. The mint delivered its first coins in March of 1793, 11,178 copper cents. Today, two major mints in Denver and Philadelphia produce all the coins needed for the United States, but in the early days, large frontiers and poor roads were a problem minting all the coins in just one place, and especially out on the frontier where miners and mineral seekers needed a convenient way to turn their gold and silver into coins and bills and bars. In 1799, a 12-year-old boy named Conrad Reed pulled a 17-pound yellow rock out of a stream near Charlotte, North Carolina. His family used it as a doorstop for three years until Reed's father, John, brought it to a jeweler and sold it for $3.50 in 1802, less than $90 in today's money. The jeweler would later make a thousand-fold profit on the rock, and John Reed, furious at being swindled, started placer mining on his farm. The North Carolina gold rush would underlie the need for another mint. Federal coinage was rare in the South, and the need for a saying or determining the purity and value of the gold was driving growing demand for the government to establish a mint in Charlotte. A German immigrant and jeweler named Christopher Backler created his own mint, and in 1831 began a saying and smelting quarter eagle and half eagle equivalent bars. He minted his first $1 coin in 1832, becoming the first gold $1 coin to be minted in the U.S., and between 1836 and 1838 would mint over $770,000 worth of gold coins. His business fell off when the government finally authorized several branch mints, including one in Charlotte, that opened in 1837 and used the mint mark C. The government, of course, had reason to be wary of private minting operations, and though they had declined several times, they were finally forced to bend to the public will. Almost simultaneously, a second gold rush was underway in the North Georgia mountains near the small town of Licklog. 
In fact, gold had been known in the area for centuries, with Native Americans and Spanish, such as explorer Hernando de Soto, both panning for and using the gold as early as the 16th century. The gold rush wasn't touched off until 1829, and numerous people claimed to have made the discovery. A man named Benjamin Parts claimed to make the first discovery October 27, 1828, but there are holes in his story. He originally claimed to have discovered it in 1827, but someone pointed out that the land ownership records didn't line up. Prospectors were already arriving in November of 1828, which seems unlikely if he'd only just discovered the gold a few days earlier. Another story says that John Witheroos was the first to find a three-ounce nugget in Duke's Creek. And yet another story claims that Jesse Hogan, a prospector from North Carolina, first found the first gold near Dahlonega. None of the claims have been definitively proven. Whoever discovered the gold, by 1829 a Georgia newspaper announced two gold mines had been discovered in this county. By 1830, mining operations had begun in earnest. Problematically, much of the land in northern Georgia belonged to the Cherokee, a fact that the miners and Georgia politicians were happy to ignore. The Cherokee called it the Great Intrusion, and the Cherokee Phoenix, a native newspaper, reported that men who regard no law and pay no respects to the laws of humanity are now reaping a plentiful harvest. We are an abused people. In 1832, Georgia decided that the fairest way to deal with the issues of land ownership was to seize the Cherokee land and raffle it off. Men paid $10 to enter and could win a lot of 40 acres. This also meant that any existing mines would change hands. It was in part due to the gold rush that in 1838 the Cherokee were forcibly removed to Oklahoma along the infamous Trail of Tears. That same year, a mint opened in Dahlonega, the town's name coming from a Cherokee word for yellow. This is the mint that originally used the D mint mark. Before the mint was built there, it could take as much as three months for gold to be assayed and a certificate to be sent by the Philadelphia Mint. Still, between 1830 and 1837, $1.7 million in Georgia gold deposits were sent to Philadelphia. Dahlonega would mint 1.5 million coins, worth more than $6 million by the time it closed in 1861. The government authorized these branch mints to meet the needs of the local miners who could not get their gold properly assayed with local independent assayers who were often the barkeepers and traders themselves. And the last of the mints that were authorized in 1835 was in New Orleans. While Dahlonega and Charlotte produce exclusively gold coins, the mint at New Orleans wasn't created to serve a gold rush. Instead, the New Orleans mint was meant to alleviate the problem of coin scarcity in the South and West. It was estimated that in 1830, only one small coin, a dime, half dime, or quarter, existed for every person in the country. The U.S. was not even minting silver dollars, which they had stopped in 1804 because the American coins were being traded for underweight Spanish coins in the Caribbean. This problem was exacerbated by President Jackson, who in 1836 required that land payments be made in gold or silver. New Orleans was chosen for its strategic location as a trading port. It conducted more foreign trade than any other city in the nation. It would become the most important branch mint in the country, and would mint over $300 million in coinage. All three branch mints were seized by the Confederate States of America shortly after their respective states seceded. All three minted coins under the Confederacy, mostly with the same staff. 887 half eagles were minted in Charlotte in the nine days they kept it open. Claire Birdsell, a mint historian, estimated that the mint at Dahlonega produced around 1,600 half eagles and 3,000 gold dollars after secession. The New Orleans Mint lasted the longest, minting just under a million silver half-dollar coins until April of 1861. The Confederates also seized the nearly half million dollars in coins that were already stored there. Only the Mint at New Orleans would open again, and then not until 1879. It closed for good in 1909. On January 24th, 1848, James W. Marshall reported finding gold at a mill he was building in Coloma, California, in what was then Mexico, but would soon be part of the United States. News of his find sparked the largest American gold rush in history. In 1852, the government decided to open the Mint's fourth branch in San Francisco. In 1854, the Mint officially opened and its first year produced over $4 million in gold coins. The Mint would outgrow the original facility to be replaced by the Granite Lady, an enormous building built to withstand earthquakes. It was one of only a few buildings that survived the Great Earthquake in 1906. It moved to a third location in 1937. The Mint was closed in 1955, though it took over proof coinage from Philadelphia in 1965 and regained its status as a branch mint in 1988. While the Civil War raged, Americans in the West were still living on hard times on the frontier and prospectors were still looking for their big break. In 1848, a group of Cherokee following the Cherokee Trail to California found some gold in a creek in what would become eastern Colorado. 
The charismatic William Green Russell had grown up near Dahlonega during the Gold Rush and then participated in the California Gold Rush. He married a member of the Cherokee tribe and in 1858 led a party into the Colorado wilderness. This would eventually spark the Pikes Peak Gold Rush. Like earlier gold rushes, locals minted coins in the absence of the government, most prominently the firm of Clark, Gruber, and Company. The government eventually bought the company out and opened an assay office in 1862. Though significant amounts of gold were brought to the office, the government didn't open a mint in Denver until 1906, giving it the mint mark D since Delonica had been closed for over 40 years. It is the only U.S. mint mark to be used by two separate mints. In 1864, a branch mint was also authorized at Dallas City, Oregon, due to gold rushes in the region. But a series of delays, including the death of the first director on his way to the mint, meant construction did not even begin until 1869. The waning gold rushes and the creation of the San Francisco Mint essentially made the mint obsolete, and construction was abandoned in 1870. In 1859, news got out that gold had been found on the eastern slope of Mount Davidson in present-day Nevada. The real story wasn't about the gold, though, as the men there had found what would turn out to be the first major discovery of silver ore in the United States. Whoever made the discovery is up for some debate. The find is known as the Comstock Lode, after miner Henry Comstock, but it is clear that he did not discover it. In 1850, a young Pennsylvanian named Abner Blackburn was leading a party of Mormon gold seekers to California. As they waited for the snow in the mountains to melt, he went out to the ravines to prospect and found gold in small quantities in three places. It wasn't enough to stop them heading to California, but Blackburn left a name for the place in his journal, Gold Canyon. By 1857, there were others panning for gold in the area, but only a pair of brothers named Allen and Hosea Grosh realized that the thick blue clay that was clogging the miners' machines was not worthless, but was in fact silver. They tried to raise money to mine the silver veins that they'd identified, but life on the frontier claimed them both. Hosea injured himself with a pickaxe and died of the infection. Allen stayed long enough to borrow money for a good suit to bury his brother in, and then to pay off the debt for the suit. And by the time he and a partner started the trek over the mountains to find investors, it was autumn, and a troublesome donkey slowed them down until they were caught in a storm. They died without ever reaching California. In 1859, Peter O'Reilly and Patrick McLaughlin made claims in the area. Comstock showed up shortly after they made their claim and insisted that they had either jumped his claim or that he had already owned the land as a ranch, according to later stories. He was able to coerce the two into letting him and one of his friends join them as partners in the claim. A local rancher named B.A. Harrison, about 10 miles from Comstock's mine, took some of the ore to be assayed in the town of Grass Valley by a judge named James Walsh. Walsh found that there was gold in the ground there, but more importantly, he identified the blue clay as silver. Harrison, Walsh, and some other associates hurried to buy or make claims on the load. Comstock would eventually sell his claim in the mine to Walsh for $11,000. The rush itself didn't really start until Walsh sent 40 tons of silver and gold ore to San Francisco. By 1863, the value of the Comstock load, so named supposedly because Comstock was a braggart and made himself visible, was so great that the U.S. authorized a branch mint in nearby Carson City. Though its cornerstone wasn't laid until 1866, no coins were minted until 1870. The mint ran from 1870 to 1885, was closed for a time for political reasons until 1889, and then closed again for good in 1893. It minted over $49 million worth of gold and silver coins, especially, and perhaps most famously, the Morgan Silver Dollar, with the CC mint mark. The history of these short-lived, often forgotten U.S. branch mints is part of the history of the American frontier and the story of the thousands of men and women who went out to seek fortune and freedom in these isolated lands that held so much promise. And the existence of branch mints was a, a trusted edifice of federal power in these far-flung places. You know, before the ubiquity of U.S. coins, coins in the United States were minted by whoever had a smelter and a press, and replacing them with U.S. minted coins was a significant important symbol of the power and presence of the U.S. federal government on the frontier. The original mint in Philadelphia was torn down in the early 1900s as the owner couldn't convince the city that it was worth it to upkeep the old buildings. The mint buildings in Charlotte, Carson City, New Orleans, and Dahlonega all still stand and are all currently being used as museums. The original mint in San Francisco burned to the ground, but the Granite Lady still stands and after much renovation is used as a public space and can be rented out for events. Now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. 
learn a little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and of course, some behind the scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. So I I wrote this episode, and one of the reasons I did is because this is a particularly interesting topic to me. Uh, I've been collecting coins since I was a kid. I had an after school program where uh, we collected pennies. And ever since then, I've I've enjoyed collecting coins. Uh, have you ever collected coins? I recall that million pennies thing there at that school. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm I'm not the coin collector you are. You are the numismatist of the pair. Uh, so I have I have a few. I have a few that my dad handed down to me, and you know people notice in these episodes that I can do some of the coin flourishes with my fingers and stuff. Uh, but uh, I'm not I'm not really a coin collector. I think that's mostly you. And uh, f- for many of these episodes, if people don't know, we do we do go and, and purchase some of these coins, uh, some of these unique coins, and then usually I. I I send those to Josh because he's the one that has the collection. Uh, but I do, I do like them. I mean, it's, it's a reason to care about mints. It is, but I mean, they they make such interesting history, and you can see why then that adds to that that entire hobby of collecting coins. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a large part of why I've enjoyed collecting them is that they do they they all have really interesting connections to history. I like learning about the parts where they've you know changed changed the size of the the fonts and stuff like that. It's a it's interesting to me. But this this episode in particular, you know, we were talking about these various mints that don't exist anymore and that some of them existed only for a very short time and i think i i don't i think a lot of them are total almost totally forgotten i mean i think some of the people in the area because when we posted it people were saying that so oh that's still here it's a museum Uh, but i mean i don't think that most people in the nation are aware of them i think probably even a lot of people in the area aren't aware that 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 the mint's there and it it represents such a chunk of history that you know mints were just sort of randomly put there Uh, there was something going on that was a reason that you needed a coin supply uh, and that's a really yeah. interesting chunk of the history of it. I, I, you know, I don't think people really think about the mint, you know, think about the director of the mint being an important position. Uh, and and when you when you really think about it, I mean, our coinage is incredibly important to our entire economy. Yeah. Uh, and then our coinage also says a lot about us culturally. So of course, I I grew up in an era where the coins looked alike and they didn't change for for you know for decades at a time. Uh, and then suddenly we hit this point. I mean, we had the bicentennial quarters, and that was something really unique. I mean, that hadn't been done. And then suddenly we hit this point where we decided that we were going to change our stuff up, and now we have a you know a million different kinds of quarters, new quarters coming out every week. Uh, and, yeah. and and so I mean, it's it, it, it's actually more exciting when you're wondering what's on the back of the quarter than all the backs of the quarters all look the same. I mean, kind of is, but but I mean now we see it almost as a hobby. But but at the time, you know, you had like a gold rush going on. There was there was all sorts of money, but there was no way to turn that into currency, uh, and people had to way have to have a way to convert that into cash, uh, and that's that's makes for such an interesting story. And so if, if you understand where a mint was, you understand there's more history there than just that that building was a mint. I, I thought that was one of the interesting things is is that I, I kind of think of mints as you know a piece of this. There, I mean, it's production. It's a it's a factory, and yet they really have a lot to do with the history of the frontier uh mm-hmm. they, they're built in places where i mean where people are coming up with the money uh the raw materials and that's different i mean you know now we've got the federal reserve system we don't back our stuff up on gold uh, but you know that was a time where uh, the gold was meant meant <laughs> meant as much well, I mean, as, as the cash when you're on the frontier you're largely going to be a border society and there's a point yeah. where the frontier is going to move from a barter society to a society that's going to need some sort of monetary system uh, and if you you know you never think about it, but I mean, where do you get all those coins, and where do you get people yeah. who trust the meaning of those coins and the value of those coins? And so, I mean, that was that was really a huge chunk of civilizing a chunk of the frontier is that they they had for some reason crossed over from when you could do you know your business without, for the most part, using any sort of currency at all, to where because of you know a number of reasons, sometimes it's just there's so much specie running around because of the of the, the mine or whatever to where you have to be able to have some sort of convertible currency. And so they're, yeah. I mean, they are really a part of the growth and the frontier and modernization. And they really say a lot more about the growth of the nation than, than, than you would think. And then of course you have that unique wrinkle uh, when we have an insurrection, when we have a civil war yeah. and now who's controlling the mint because, uh, because of what the mint means. So I, it really, I, I mean, it surprised me, honestly, not just that some of these mints I didn't even know existed, didn't even know they had, you know, mint marks on them, but also what those said about the history of where they are and how the nation grew is really tied very much to our, you know, the mints as they go forward. So, I mean, now, yeah. you know, we have whole mints that are just, you know, stamping out commemorative coins. Uh, and and uh, but I mean, it seems almost frivolous, but I mean, it's kind of like that idea that, you know, now you also only ride horses for fun. But I mean, at a time, mints were like horses. They were an absolutely essential piece of being able to, to you know, get done what you needed to get done. Yeah. 
I think we learned a little bit of that, like, you know, when we have the coin shortage, uh, you, you take you take coins for, for granted is that everyone everyone's got and there's always more coins available. Uh, but you did have a have a point where I mean, it was actually difficult to give mm -hmm. exact change. And uh, that that's uh, that was true constantly. I mean, they talk about, you know, when they opened the New Orleans Mint, the whole purpose of that one was that there were there were no coins in the South. And it's interesting to think about that in terms of the way that, you know, um, how urban living was going on is that in the north the coins are much more common it's where the mint was uh, and it's also just where money was was changing hands more often and in the south you know you tended to be more rural and you had and they had difficulty and it's it's interesting to think about the the fact that you might be able to have uh silver or gold but not any ability to turn that into money yeah, turn convertible currency i mean during gold rushes uh, i mean they would use gold dust and whatever they would yeah, let, yeah. you know little take pieces but i mean there's there's a point at which you have to you have to be able to trust that it is the purity that you claim it is that it's the weight that you claim it is and make it a convertible currency and that is uh, that you know that's something you know largely unique to western economies uh, but it, it really did represent you know the growth of a nation in a very important way because it says this has become an urban center enough that people have to have coins and the coins are on the frontier because that's, you know, that's where there weren't coins. You just didn't have enough. Of yeah. them. Now there's more wealth than there is money to represent the wealth. So, I mean, it is, it's a very interesting story. And then, of course, each of these buildings has their own interesting history. And this is what makes it really such a fascinating episode. It's not, it's one of those episodes where you might be thinking, what, you know, you know, and uh, where you find out, wow, this history is a lot more interesting than you would have thought it was. And, and interesting yeah. even beyond, you know, people who collect coins. Though it certainly made you want to collect a number of coins, too. I mean, and uh, yeah. I mean, it's like, oh, no, I don't have one of those, you know. Uh, That's uh, I I mean, it's interesting that, you know, like the Carson City Mint is famous for uh, for all of the, the Morgan silver dollars, which were otherwise actually not especially popular coins. But they minted a ton of them there because they had all that silver. Yeah, the silver, yeah. Really yeah, it's it's a it's a really interesting. I mean, each piece of it, and um, we talk a little bit about each of the you know each of these times that they find uh, the gold or the the one the one family had like a, a chunk of rock that they were using as a doorstop, which they uh -huh. find out is actually full of gold. <laughs> it's it's some really it's some really interesting stories. And I mean, it, they they touch all kinds of pieces of history. I mean, the one in uh, Dahlonega ends up talk you know ends up touching on the the yeah trail of tears and the cherokee removal yeah. it's interesting how each of these mints had something to do with things that were going on locally but also i mean to some extent things that are going on nationally and things that mattered and we and things that we learn about in the history books but i mean when you learn about the trail of tears you almost never learn about the uh the mint yeah the gold there well yeah you know, the the, or the georgia gold rush is this impact on, yeah. the, on the trail of tears i mean i think these that we don't necessarily talk about i also thought it was very interesting this episode that you had private coinage which is i think we think yeah we even conceive of that right now that actually went on much longer say in australia where you, you can get coins from wine companies actually make coinage and you know and that makes a lot of unique coins but you know the idea that the demand is so high that someone's going to serve that demand and that's a, that's just a surprise because how do you when you have to trust something like currency it's hard to imagine that coming yeah. out of a out of a private mint that you're trusting that you know the weight and the purity of that. Yeah, that was interesting. One of the the first gold coins. Yeah, yeah. And, and the the first gold coins minted in the U.S. were minted by a private mint. Yeah, by private. And literally just that that's crazy to think about because I, I can't imagine just having a coin that you're like, ah, oh, this was made by uh, George so and so or or whatever. And I'm trusting that uh, first of all, that and everyone's it, going to accept and, it. You know, and that was quite common. That was actually well common yeah. in the 19th century. There were a lot of uh, banks and railroads that issued their own currency, their own paper currencies and stuff like that. And that currency yeah. was, was currency. Uh, and uh, it, you know, now you only think of currencies as really being a government entity. But then again, we also have cryptocurrency, which is kind of the same thing. It just it just doesn't use a mint. Yeah, and it's it's got its own. I mean, it's an interesting, but it has just some of the same issues. It does. Uh, yeah, and who can who's going to accept it? And because it's true that you know if you're if you're a store shop owner, you are accepting a piece of you know a piece of gold that you want to deposit someplace and you're accepting a coin from some guy you have to believe that you know this that this gold is worth what it says it is and that's i mean that's where people got in trouble so that, that was that's a lot of the ways that you know when people are making fake coins you make them out of brass or something like that that is similar or mostly brass and gold coat it uh, it's the same it's the exact same fears that these are you know these are all falsified coins and we're we're going to find out that these are all worth nothing and these these days, you know, you're right. All money, pretty much all money, in most places in the world, is, is made by a, some kind of government. Um, and it's different. Um, 
the pa- paper money is a little different. Uh, they, they, they're not made at mints for the most part. They're actually, we've got a lot of places around the country that print paper money, uh, which is another kind of an interesting, maybe that's history we'll talk about. Uh, all, all the little letters and stuff, on you can find out all kinds of information about where the dollar was made and uh, from, from just looking at a dollar bill. And it's, it's I, I enjoy looking at that kind of stuff too. Yeah, maybe uh, we'll, uh, we'll do some more. I'm sure that there'll be more episodes. And, you know, coins are certainly worth discussing. We've, and we've done quite a few about yeah. coins. And it's kind of cool that when we do that, we also did the one on credit cards. Uh, it, it, when we do that, that inspires us to go find pe- buy pieces. So a lot of the pictures in these episodes are actually us taking pictures of coins that we yeah. acquired for the episode. That's, by the way, a funny thing to mention about public domain rules. Uh, if you uh, if you take a picture of a two, of a two dimensional image, then you can't copyright the photo of uh, of, of the two dimensional. There's there's kind of some ways that you can, but in general, uh, you know, if you take a picture of a picture, that's not enough uh, trans enough artistic transference for you to be able to copyright that. But if you take a picture of a sculpture, you can copyright that because there's more artistic license in how you take the angle of the sculpture. And one of the odd things that that means is that in general, if you take a picture of a piece of historic currency, it cannot be copyrighted. But if you take a picture of a historical coin, it can, and quite often those are. Uh, and so it's sometimes yeah. hard to find images that we can use of these coins. And sometimes the best way to do that is to acquire the coin and then take all the pictures we want because uh, because you like collecting coins. And, and so this, yeah. this adds and to the hobby. I don't, I, I mean, I don't have anything particularly like especially rare, to be honest. Uh, I mostly collect stuff that I think is cool historically. Yeah. Uh, so I've got like a, I've got a, I've got a Barr note, which was the, the, he, William Barr was the shortest uh, secretary of the treasury. He served for like 37 days or something like that. So a very small number of these notes uh, had his signature on them. Um, but people knew that. <laughs> so nearly every one of them that was, uh, that was made was snatched up by a collector. And so crazily, even though they're like the, the rarest bill or whatever they have a way higher survival rate than almost any other bill because collectors snapped them all up and so they're not really worth much but <laughs> I, d- I got one at a uh, at a garage sale actually which i thought was kind of cool so that's the, the sometimes you find little, little yeah cool things it, like it's, that. it's a piece of history it's a piece of history i'd say the, say the same in my hat collection i don't have anything that's overly yeah. valuable in there but i have a lot of pieces that say a lot to me about history and that's why we collect them yeah. Uh, and yeah. so that that's good. That's a good uh, something behind these episodes is one of the reasons that we're doing these episodes is that Josh has a particular interest in collecting coins. Uh, and uh, so then that, you know, sparks the idea for the episode. And then these become really fantastic episodes. They're really enjoyable because yeah. they, they tell you much more about it. You don't have to love coins to realize, you know, what, what they say. And, you know, some totally, you know, unique stuff in there. And we'll talk about the Philippine one. But I mean, where they had coins for the leper yeah. colony. I mean, you know, who would thought, you know, crazy. Yeah. Um, I also, I love that we had a coin called an eagle and a half eagle uh-huh. and a quarter eagle. I, I think those are really cool coins. I understand why at the time, you know, a, a $10 coin was would have been a lot of, <laughs> was a pretty large sum of money in, in the uh, the 18th century and then the 19th century. I, I kind of wonder if they'll, if they'll, and they do sometimes still mint like some special versions of those. Like you can get an eagle from, I think they mint, um, I don't, I don't think any for general circulation, but the, the San Francisco mint or the West Point mint will mint some of those um i wonder if they'll make a comeback as we uh, and i don't know what things will turn out to be but as if you know if inflation continues and we get to a point where the money's you know worth less maybe a ten dollar coin is going to make more sense I, I wonder if we'll if we'll ever get yeah, to I don't that know. Point. I mean, obviously though if you visit europe uh they'll do a lot more on coins than we do I mean, yeah, yeah that's also actually, i was surprised last time i went to europe i actually didn't end up using the currency that i bought because uh europe is actually moving more and more to everything occurring with a card uh but yeah. uh uh, that uh, you know, the, it's very common, you know, into you know, have uh, five and ten pound coins. You know, that's what you get in England. I don't weigh ten pounds or near ten pound a coin that represents ten yeah. pounds. Uh, and uh, so, I, so I mean, it's kind of surprising that we haven't done here that here because there's it's it's easier to circulate. It lasts much longer, uh, and it's yeah. really very simple when you figure it out to just operate from coins. Uh, and so you're much less likely to use uh, paper currency. Actually, when I was in the UK, the currency is kind of plastic now. But uh, uh, so I, I, you know, I, it's kind of funny because there's reasons to think that we would. I mean, the rest of the world kind of does use larger notes and have things that would be like a two and a half dollar note or, or a five dollar note or, or, yeah. 10, or coins. Uh, and those uh, could be in some ways much easier to operate than with the bills that we tend to operate with. Uh, but I don't know. It's hard to say now because honestly, we're we're using less and less cash of any kind now. That's that's fair. Maybe we'll never need there never be a reason to make a ten dollar uh, 
a ten a ten dollar coin. If you've ever had nothing to eat or drink except for a machine that doesn't like your dollar bill, you'd be understanding why you operate for coins. Yeah, that's the the machines like I don't recognize this one, but the coins yeah, are, like, coins are your usually quarters bent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they never reject your coins, but the, they 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 are quite often don't like your bills. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I do wonder when they when we talk you know talk about the Confederacy seizing them. That that is essentially what ended the the Dahlonega and the Charlotte Mint. And I yeah. wonder if we would have operated those. I mean, the other thing is that as Frontier was going across, you know, maybe we had less need for those. Uh, Philadelphia was was able to. Uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, transportation changed, so it was easier to move coins yeah. distances. Uh, and and secondly, I mean, you you start off, you got none. You really got to produce a supply. But once you hit that supply, there's much less demand afterwards, you know, to continue producing in those numbers. You're just yeah, replacing, yeah. you know, what's, what's gone bad. So, I, you know, the, we've had lots of mints that really ran and ran and ran in the, well, you know, San Francisco and then essentially shut down. And, you know, and, uh, the West Point Mint now only makes commemoratives and stuff like that. So I, I don't think they would have lasted forever because I think that the nation yeah. now only runs on a couple of mints and, and that makes all the coins that we really need. Uh, but uh, obviously, you know, that shift is, you know, uh, had it not been for the Civil War, those those mints might have run much longer. Uh, and, you know, the Civil yeah. War affected a lot of different things. But one of the interests, because one of the big questions of the Civil War was if a state decides to secede, what happens to federal property in that state, uh, including, you know, the, the very valuable, you know, straight up money that's sitting in these mints. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And I, they seized, they seized it. <laughs> it is, it's one of the, it is one of the complicated questions is that it, those, those federal, uh, that the federal property for things uh -huh. like the mints and stuff, like they never really, there never really was that a was system That was an issue with the breakup of the Soviet that. Union. Yeah. You know, I, I yeah, hope yeah. we don't have a civil war now, but I mean, what do you do then with nuclear weapons and Navy ships? So, I mean, that's, as well as mints. Yeah. Does Kentucky get to keep the gold in Fort Knox or you know, does that somehow still represent US currency? So let's hope we don't have a civil war because that way that, those are, that's a, that's a sort of, you know, divorce proceeding that you don't want to try to deal with. Who gets the mint? Yeah, as as we talk about, you know, the the fact that we're less and less, uh, we we pay for almost everything these days with cards. And uh, now uh, this might be this might be something that came slowly. I'm more a rural area, but I'm seeing a lot more places where uh, you can just tap the card. You don't have to insert it into anything. Yeah, just yeah. tap it on the thing, and it'll buy it. That's uh, that was only pretty recently here where I started actually seeing people use those, mostly because the chip readers are all breaking on the gas station <laughs> and none, yeah, none yeah, of those seem to work anymore just tap, yeah and i was what i noticed when i travel is that they're always a, a couple of years ahead of us in england I mean, and so that they had tap cards yeah. uh when my car didn't do that and, and then they came here they had chip cards before my car did that and, and uh, uh yeah i mean it's getting to i mean you know, where he's going to have something i think you know implanted in your wrist yeah. and you're just going to shake it over there and who who knows how it's going to work? And you know, do you trust it if the system goes down? You know, how, how do you know that you actually have the money you have? And uh, it leads, you know, it leads to an interesting question. I'm sure there's people that are still hoarding gold, saying it's going to be the only, the yeah. only sort of hard currency that's going to exist. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I honestly don't know the future of currency because I really don't yeah. know that, that that there's going to be much use for it. I mean, certainly we're not much using currency today. So I mean, there's, it seems at least we're going to hit a point where we need far less of actual you know, physical currency that, you know, hang on. And, uh, you know, that the, we see changes in society and changes in economies that transform what happens at mints and transforms how you do monetary supply, and that will continue to occur. Yeah. It's, you know, they've talked, I mean, they've been talking for years about getting rid of the penny because it costs more than it, you know, costs more to make than it's worth. And uh, it's, it's, I've always wondered about the, the logistics of that, you know, getting rid of the penny because, does that mean we've learned apparently with the coin shortage that there's not necessarily enough pennies just in circulation to keep the uh, keep gas stations full of pennies? And I wonder what that what that means for exact change. Uh, I don't know. But, if we're just I, if we're just going to round it up, or, or you know whatever we're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. They you see. But I pay for everything with a card. Who, like make a whole floor out of pennies or something like that. I'm like, wow, yeah. that. now the copper value is more than the. You wonder how that's not so heavy <laughs> that it falls through your roof, but or into the basement. But I, I was, well, I've had people talk about that. I said, go buy Mexican coins. They're much cheaper. And, uh, you know, it's, you could, the peso is worth less than a penny. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's bigger, it's cheaper. It'll, you know, cover your floor faster. And, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, uh, one. Yeah, some... I, don't, I, I don't know how we'd live without pennies. I don't know. I mean, yeah. we had that interesting project when you were when you were a kid way back in elementary school where they were going to collect a million pennies to see what they look like. And I think that they actually hit the goal there. I think that last I, I saw so, that so. was many years ago was just sitting in a box. There. I wonder if it's still in the box. Maybe that's why there's a coin shortage. 
It's like some <laughs> a million pennies. Many elementary schools with boxes of a million pennies. Yeah, but because uh, ultimately a million pennies isn't a, isn't a that much actually like that 10, much money, dollars. but it's very heavy. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. yeah, that's the. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so, what have you been watching on Magellan TV? I said, you know, I decided uh, to go Halloweeny uh, because they had a whole watch list on Halloween. So I watched one called Vampire Skeletons, uh, which is really quite interesting. It's another one of those uh, it could have been a History Guy episode, but it's about uh, some skeletons they dug up in Ireland, actually. But uh, it, it has to do with, I mean, the traditions of how you deal with remains are always interesting. They say a lot about culture. We've talked a lot about that. So they found some skeletons that were truly anomalous, like someone had shoved a big rock in the mouth after death. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and they had various kinds of mutilations and stuff like that. And it, and it all has to do with uh, traditions. These were like ninth century. Uh, but it all has to do with uh, with traditions. But it, it is, it was this fear that in some way that person that was buried was going to come back as some sort of, of undead, of revenant. That it predates the, the vampire, you know, stories and stuff like that. It predates the legends of hmm. vampires. Uh, but there, I mean, there, there are ones where they, someone has, you know, driven spikes through the hands and, and chest so that it can't get up or or they cut off the head and turn it sideways or stuff like that. They were, they were very deliberate post-mortem mutilations that were intended to keep anybody in that coffin from getting up and then bugging everybody else. Uh, and that's a fascinating piece of history. And then it becomes, I mean, it's a very interesting uh, uh, documentary uh, because it's happened all over the world in different ways and different times for different reasons. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's also just the archaeology part of it of them just trying to figure out how, how this occurred, yeah. where it did and why it did. Uh, and so, I mean, it was it was uh, it wasn't spooky in terms of Halloween, ooh, ooh, spooky, but it really was interesting to see. You know, you find a bunch of bones, and you're trying to figure out what is the story of these bones, because obviously these were done differently for a reason. I love about Magellan TV is that whatever mood you're in, they got something. You know, they're putting up hours and hours yeah. of new of new documentaries every single week. I, I I will say that it's it would be a little spooky to pull up a coffin and find the the head taken off or the skeleton is. I, 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 I wouldn't I wouldn't people. want it in my backyard. That's certainly true. What what, <laughs> what have you been watching on Magellan TV lately? Uh, so what I was watching was it's called Castle Builders, and it's it's an interesting. I, it just caught my eye, uh, and it was all about them building. There's three episodes of it. They are talking about castles, and they do a lot of CGI and stuff like that. I always love when you fly through a castle and CGI. Uh, this this episode mostly talked about England and it, to some extent France because the, of the Norman invasion. Uh, but it's really really interesting to talk about how we how they built castles. It talks a little bit about the the earlier versions, uh, the fact that most early castles were built of wood and not stone. So Mott and Bailey's and stuff like that and then it talks about how they how they used fortresses it talked a lot about whales actually and the fighting there and mm -hmm. it's interesting to learn you know kind of the stories behind all of these castles because it required a lot of effort i look forward to watching the rest of it because it's got a couple more episodes uh the first one is mostly talking about the the masters and masons is what it's called so it talks about the the kings that were building them and the the people that were designing them and especially you know these castles are still around we we build even I mean we build buildings to be you know disposable today I mean it's something that's going to yeah, be replaced yeah. and you know this idea that these are still around is actually really extraordinary isn't it Absolutely yeah I I think it's really I've always enjoyed I've been in a couple of castles in Europe uh -huh. and I I think they're just so amazing and uh, when you see like you know the the steps are worn in from so many people walking on them it's, yeah. it's an incredible it's an incredible way to experience history. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the great things about Magellan is that literally you can you can jump from thing to thing and you're always learning something. I mean, that's what's amazing to me is that there I've not seen one of these. They're always quality and you are going to learn some really cool it stuff. Is. I, I think they've got the best history content uh, of any of these uh, subscription channels. I really do. But I, I mean, so. you find as the history guy, I don't always just want to watch history. You know, cause that's what we're doing all the time. Uh, so that also I love their, their their true crime, their space. I mean, they, they've just got everything there is. And it's it's run by documentary filmmakers. And we you know, we got to work with them. They're really great people. And of course, if you are a listener or watcher of The History Guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash history guy, where we will always have a deal for you. Sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash history guy. Next up, the History Guy talks about the only U.S. Mint not built on American soil. And stay tuned after the episode to hear us chat a little more with the History Guy. 
We often take them for granted. Heck, in the modern era when almost everything is paid for by card, we even seem to sometimes forget that they exist. But coins have played important roles both in culture and in history. Today, it's possible to look at a coin that was minted 2,000 years ago or more. And you know, every mark on there, it has meaning. And that might be even more true in the modern era when any coin that you have is likely to have a date on it. Sometimes some sort of mark to say where it was minted. It tells you a lot about the history of the coin. And while Americans are generally familiar with the mints in Denver and Philadelphia, maybe San Francisco, actually the U.S. Mint has operated many mints throughout history, and perhaps the least remembered was the U.S. Mint in Manila in the Philippines, the only U.S. Mint to be operated outside of North America. And that mint and the coins that the U.S. minted for the Philippines say a lot about the history of the era, from the dawn of U.S. imperialism to the bloody fighting of the Second World War. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Ferdinand Magellan first claimed the Philippines for the Spanish crown when he arrived there in 1521. Monetary policy in the colony was complex. Many regional currencies entered the economy and locals struck illegal coins to ease problems with supply. The Spanish peso coin, also known as the Spanish dollar or pieces of eight, would be physically cut into eight pieces to use as fractional currency. In 1857, the Spanish acquired accounts to be kept in pesos made up of 100 centavos, and in 1861 opened the Casa de Moneda, which would mint coins locally. By the mid-19th century, the Spanish Empire was in a deep decline, and the far-off province's mint was poorly managed. Queen Isabel II was deposed in 1868, but the Casa de Moneda minted coins with her face in the 1868 date for four more years. When King Alfonso died in 1885, he was succeeded by his then unborn son, but from 1885 to 1897, the coins minted bore Alfonso's face in the 1885 date. The Spanish-American War began in February 1898, instigated by the sinking of the USS Maine in the Havana-Cuba harbor. The short war was a complete American victory, with the superior American Navy proving decisive. The American force blockading Manila staged an attack on the city on August 13th, unaware that peace protocols had been signed the day before in Washington, D.C. Sometimes called the Mock Battle of Manila, Spanish-American forces had negotiated the terms of the battle days before, mostly as a means of keeping the large Philippine Independence Army from occupying the city center. The Spanish officially gave up the Philippines in December for $20 million, and the Philippines were run under the insular government of the Philippine Islands, which ultimately reported up to the U.S. Department of War, and that's why the governors were called Governors General. Fighting with Philippine independence groups started almost immediately, and some groups were still opposing U.S. control to 1913. The Philippines were unique in that they are the only American territory which had special coinage minted for it, due in part to the weak state of the economy after the years of war. The first coins made for the American Philippine territory were minted at the San Francisco and Philadelphia mints. They based the new coinage on the Spanish currency, minting silver pesos as well as 50, 20, 10, 5, and 1 centavo pieces. Philippine sculptor Malicio Figueroa designed the obverses with a seated man for the base metal pieces and a standing woman for the silver ones. The Denver Mint would eventually mint some Filipino coinage in 1944 and 45. In 1904, the U.S. demonetized all of the currencies in the territory. The currency of the island was standardized as the gold peso, which was locked in value at a rate of two pesos for one U.S. dollar, and several funds were started to maintain the value of the currency. It's interesting to note that when first minted, the 1903 peso actually had slightly more silver than the U.S. Morgan silver dollar, although it was worth only half as much. In 1907, a rise in silver prices led to a reduction in the peso's silver content, but the value relative to the dollar remained the same. In 1908, San Francisco took over the minting of base metal coins and produced most of the island's coins until 1920. The measure that Theodore Roosevelt signed in 1902 that authorized the minting of Filipino coins actually said that the coins should be minted in Manila if practicable, but it took 18 years for that to happen. The First World War dramatically reshaped the global economy. By 1915, the Philadelphia Mint had taken over much of the business of minting South American coins when European mints became preoccupied. The war also drove the San Francisco Mint to dedicate more of its resources to meeting the increased domestic demand for coins. The war also caused an economic boom in the Philippines thanks to a huge demand for hemp, coconut oil, and sugar. The coin shortage became a dire enough that the Philippine National Bank produced cardboard bills to replace 10, 20, and 50 centavo coins in 1917. An act establishing the Mint of the Philippine Islands was signed by the Governor General on February 16, 1918. Dr. Albert P. Fitzsimmons, the insular treasurer, was sent to the U.S. to procure the necessary equipment and to study the organization, installing of machinery, and the operation of United States mints. 
Because of the war, the equipment could not be found commercially, so he was obliged to approach the Philadelphia Mint, which had much of the needed machinery and was willing to manufacture the rest. Dr. Fitzsimmons was transferred from the Treasury to lead the Mint, primarily because of his poor leadership at Treasury, had widely been panned. At the end of 1919, the Mint equipment arrived under supervision of Philadelphia Mint staff, who oversaw the installation and training of Filipino personnel. The Mint was not housed in the new building, but given the first floor of the older Aduana building, which it shared with the Treasury, Senate, and other government offices. The first coins were minted on July 15, 1920, including a handful of commemorative medals numismatists now call the so-called Wilson Dollar. In 1920, the Manila Mint struck nearly 7 million Filipino coins, along with more than 5,000 of the commemorative medals. But bad news was already on the horizon. The end of the war ended the demand for Filipino materials. Additionally, the Philippine National Bank, established in 1916 in part to extend loans to manufacturers and exporters, had overextended itself through loans, especially to businesses that members of its board were directly involved with. Poor American monetary policy and the collapse of commodity prices sunk the economy and caused hyperinflation. President Harding sent a mission under former Governor General William Forbes and Army General Leonard Wood to investigate conditions in the Philippines. And though Fitzsimmons had performed well at the Mint, it was clear he wouldn't escape blame for his poor handling of the Treasury. He resigned in May of 1921 and returned to the States. The Filipino legislature ordered the Mint to be folded back into the Treasury, abolishing the role of Mint Director. The Mint had 59 employees in November of 1921, but by 1923 only three remained, including a mechanic to look after the equipment. Very few coins were minted in 1922, and minting ceased completely before the end of the year. The Mint remained closed until January 2, 1925, when the recovery was underway and it began minting five centavo coins. From 1920 to 22, the coins had no mint mark, but when the Mint restarted in 1925, they used the M mint mark. For the entirety of its existence, the Manila Mint only struck a handful of one peso coins, and those that it did strike were commemoratives. In 1935, the Philippines was given self-governing Commonwealth status, along with a plan for a 10-year transitional period that would lead to independence in 1946. The Philippines wrote their own constitution, which was approved by President Roosevelt and ratified by popular vote in the islands in 1935. Manuel Quezon became the first president in November that year. The Mint struck a 10,000 Roosevelt Quezon coins in celebration. The Mint did not strike any regular issued pesos for the same reason that the American Morgan Silver Dollar was short-lived, as they were unpopular in circulation. Most of the pesos minted by the San Francisco Mint between 1907 and 1912 remained in government hands to guarantee silver certificates. The Mint produced a huge number of coins between 1936 and 38 to flood the islands with the new reverse designs, which now had the Philippine coat of arms to replace the arms of the U.S. territories. The Manila Mint also produced a special coinage for exclusive use at the Culeon leper colony. By the time the Americans arrived, there were an estimated 4,500 cases of leprosy in the Philippines and several homes run by friars to care for them. The U.S. chose instead to isolate the afflicted in an attempt to eliminate the disease and chose the island of Culeon as the site of the colony. The patients there ran a civic society, complete with police, plumbing, and a council. It was erroneously feared that leprosy could spread by touching items touched by the afflicted, and by law the colony was not allowed to use regular currency, nor was anyone else allowed to use the leper colony coins. Around 169,000 coins were struck, mostly at the Manila Mint. On December 8, 1941, shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japan bombed Manila, doing damage to the Etiwana building. Though the damage was not serious, the Mint shut down for the rest of the war. The Japanese may have operated the mint themselves, but replaced the local coins with paper centavos and pesos, now known as Japanese invasion money, or to the locals as Mickey Mouse money, because it had no value and was not real. By the end of the war, hyperinflation had forced the Japanese to print 1,000 peso bills, which they were printing even as they abandoned Manila. The Japanese took over the islands quickly. Most of the American forces had retreated to the defensive positions of Bataan by the 1st of January 1942, and General MacArthur declared Manila an open city on December 26, giving up the city without a fight in the hopes of limiting damage to the city and its population. The entirety of the Filipino treasury remained in Manila, millions in paper notes, 17 million silver pesos, and more in silver and gold bullion. To protect it, it was loaded onto a flotilla of ships that crossed the bay to Corregidor Island on December 27th. On February 3rd, the submarine USS Trout dropped off thousands of rounds of anti-aircraft ammunition and took aboard $2 million worth of bullion and some 630,000 silver pesos as ballast. The paper currency was eventually burned while the remaining pesos and bullion stayed in the underground tunnels on the island. Corregidor held out for several more months, even after soldiers at Bataan surrendered on April 9th. 
Knowing they would have to surrender, they chose to dump the coins in Caballo Bay, which provided some cover from Japanese soldiers. They drew lines between several local landmarks, and where they crossed, literally X marks the spot, they dumped 2,630 boxes full of silver pesos, some 390 tons over six nights starting on April 26th. Corregidor fell on May 6th. Some of the dumped coins would be recovered by the Japanese later that year using first Filipino and then American divers who deliberately hampered the recovery effort and funneled silver to POW camps. Official tallies say the Japanese pulled out fewer than 400 of the boxes, while the U.S. and Philippines recovered millions of pesos in 1946 and 47. Some estimates suggest several million coins may still lay on the floor of the bay. The battle to retake Manila in 1945 was the worst urban fighting in the theater and left the city heavily damaged. The Atawana building was used as a fortress in the last days of fighting and was completely bombed out by the time the shooting stopped. In 2012, Coin World magazine reported that an obverse die of the Wilson Memorial coins was found in a soldier's estate. The warrant officer's account said the building was left open for weeks after the fighting was heavily looted. The building was rebuilt after the war, occupied by offices of the National Treasury and then the Central Bank, and finally the Commission on Elections. A fire gutted the building in 1979 and has been abandoned since. For decades, it has been envisioned as the future home of the National Archive of the Philippines, and as recently as June 2019, funding had been promised for the effort, although for now, it remains in ruins. The Philippines were granted independence in 1946 as promised, but their mint was destroyed and no new coins were minted in the Philippines until 1978. Some coins were minted in international mints in the interim, but the Manila Mint, which was supposed to be part of U.S. nation building, was never reconstructed. Still, the coins that were minted there say a lot about Filipino and American history at the time, from the years that they were minted to the years that they weren't. They represent a country that was transitioning from the colonial era to the modern era, interrupted and shaped by some of the most devastating and influential conflicts in human history. The coins that were minted at the Manila Mint, from the designs on them to the numbers that were minted, well, that all, that all has meaning, meaning beyond even what was bought with the coins or whose pockets they rattled in. And those historic coins, although they are no longer currency, well, they tell a story. And like the silver pesos that are at the bottom of Manila Bay, all it takes to find the story is to look. Gosh, the Manila Mint story. What's incredible to me is as I was watching it, there is so much more <laughs> that I could have talked about uh, in this. Uh, you can it's, I mean, do a whole the, episode on the recovery. It's an obscure piece of history, it really is. I don't think that most Americans, if you ask, knew that we ran a mint yeah. in Manila. Uh, and, you know, it's the U.S. imperial history is kind of forgotten in the United States. We don't really even think of it as being, you know, empire. Uh, and But, I mean, it really does say that, you know, one of the one of the difficulties of that uh, is of running empires trying to maintain the economy in the empire. So you're right. I mean, there's, yeah. there's, and we, and that happens every episode where there's, there's, we have to decide how much we're going to fit in because it's a reason we do it in short format. Uh, but uh, it, the breadth of the history of this fairly short-lived mint, and what it says about the U.S. relationship with the Philippines and things like that, it's an absolute. Yeah. Story. It's absolute. It's another one of those where you look at it and you go like, what? One mint in the Philippines? Uh, and actually, it's a really fascinating topic that has an awful lot to it, and there's a lot more to research with it. Yeah, it's in, it's incredible. When we had put up the first video uh, the, the, that we just talked about with the forgotten U.S. mints, we had a number of people uh, be like, well, what about the one in Manila? And I, the, there was already so much to talk about. And there's so much we had to leave out of this this episode. But I, I thought it deserved its, its whole own episode. And I've seen people, you know, talk about it in a much shorter period of time. But we, we ended up starting, you know, back all the way with the Spanish. But I think that's one of the interesting things is that even even back in the Spanish, you can see the difficulties. Uh, I th the the Spanish mints is almost funny there, where they uh, are so far away that they're printing one coin that has an 1885 date for 15 years <laughs> <laughs> with the wrong with the wrong monarch on it. Yeah. But they what are they supposed to do? They're, they're clearly not making their own uh, they're <laughs> without without instructions. Uh, it's it's really kind of incredible. So what we talked about in this was already so much. So I, I, I think it was good for us to, to do it in two separate episodes, talk about the US ones, and then uh, go to this one, which is uh, really a unique story from all the other ones. Yeah, it is. And it, uh, it, it also, I mean, it's a whole different I mean, we're talking about. It's more than about a men. The men's rarely represent history. And that history yeah. there of the United States and the Philippines is just different than the history of the United States and, you know, Georgia. Uh, and yeah. there's, there's a reason that it's certainly worth discussing. And we've, we've done a few on the U.S. Uh, relationship with the Philippines. And, and I think this is really one that talks about what it really meant to try to be administering 
uh, uh, you know, a, a country like an empire does. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, Britain might have done a lot of this. Even Spain did a lot of this. It was kind of a new experience for us. Uh, and uh, yeah. and this this says a lot about you know, what we learned from that experience. Yeah, and the mint the mint was a particular piece of that. You know, you mentioned at the end of the last episode, you talk about how the the mint and the making the money is kind of a symbol of the the government's reach and power to some extent. And when you think about that as a in the you know in terms of colonialism, it's it's almost more important. It is. Well, I mean, I think every colonial power likes to think that they're improving the place that they're there. That's that's their excuse for, you know, why you're and, you know, you can talk a lot about American, you know, colonialism and imperialism or whatever. But I mean, that this shows that part of the goal was to say if we could provide a stable economy where people can thrive, then they're going to, you know, they're going to appreciate us being there. And if we can't, we can't. Uh, and so and this really showed some of the challenges of that. And, and it, you know, it's a, it's a chunk of U.S. history. I mean, there was a period when the U.S. was the imperial power that was essentially, you know, ruling the Philippines. And that led to two to, uh, 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 Filipino-American War, Filipino-American War, is that we call them now? We used to call them the, the Philippine Insurrection and the Moro Uprising. Uh, and that that terminology yeah. changed a little bit, but I mean that you know there was there was always uh, and you know, you really saw during the Second World War that there was a lot of affinity between the Filipino people and the American people, uh, and and uh, uh, but on the other hand there was always you know people from the Philippines who wanted you know yeah. simply wanted to run their own government. Given our own history, you would see that we would understand that. So this really talks about I mean a, a difficult piece of history to talk about in America, and and uh, and it it shows really the the challenges of that. Uh, you know, both high and low. I mean, and uh, so uh, again, uh, it might seem like a dry topic until you understand all the things that were impacted by the way that we were producing coinage yeah. in the Philippines and how, how much yeah. of a stretch that was for the United States meant to figure out how to do coinage for uh, foreign territory. Exactly. And this was also a place with an economy that was uh, not as modern as, as the United States was at the time. And so that's why... Uh, it wouldn't have worked for them to just print American money, could have totally, totally destroyed the economy, essentially. And so that's why this is also the only mint that has produced official American currency, uh, not in dollars and cents, but in pesos and centavos. Yeah, it's really fascinating how many people knew that we did that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I, I know that a, a number of mints and I know we've done it uh, with, you know, the Philadelphia, Philadelphia mint. We have made money for foreign countries, but you're, you're you know, you're minting that on contract and stuff like that. So it's not, it's never been official U.S. currency um, and that was unique to to the Manila mint. Uh, it was interesting to talk about, too, how long and how much they struggled uh, to get the coins minted there mm -hmm. and that the, the peso coin was, I mean, essentially never minted. They're in Manila, but almost always in San Francisco. Yeah, it's a, it's just an interesting story of it. It shows those difficulties. Yeah, yeah, it's not. And, it's more complex than you think. It's it's, uh, yeah. it's something that we so take for granted. Well, you know, we took the Philippines from Spain in 1898. Uh, wasn't until 1920 that we had a we had a mint functioning there <laughs> that that took a long time. And it wasn't just, uh, you know, making sure that we were were able to to run a mint. You want to make sure that there are people who can run it there, but you also have to move. I mean, you got to move the equipment. Mm -hmm. You got to get it there. You got to find a place for it. You got to find people who can run it. And then we talked about the 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 one guy there who did a decent job with the mint, but was uh, generally uh, less good with the treasury. And so he gets thrown out, even though like he'd kind of gotten the mint under, uh, under control. And one of the, one of the, you know, we talked about in the last one where you buy, buy some coins uh, to, some of these we already had. I had some centavos and pesos from uh, from from George, from your dad. Uh, so he had he had given me some that I think he had gotten from Uncle Jack, who had who had served in the Philippines. Uh, I, cause Jack didn't serve there. Jack served in Europe, uh, but okay, I'm not so sure. Wasn't, if, wasn't Jack. I'm not sure if he sent, spent time in the Philippines for another reason after or anything like that. Honestly, I wish I knew the yeah, story. I so I mean, I'm, I'm Uncle sure Jack did serve in the war with his brother George, and George didn't come home. Uh, but, and, uh, and Uncle Jack, I mean, he was, I, I remember my Uncle Jack quite well, but uh, why he would have spent time in the Philippines, I honestly don't know. Uh, so if those are coming from the family there, it's a story that I didn't get uh, before my dad passed. And, and it's That's interesting. those bits of forgotten history there. I don't know, you know, I don't know if anybody left knows or not. Yeah, he, he gave it to me in a, um, like a field cap. So it's, it's one, of, it, you know, would, would totally flatten out and then you could, they they, uh -huh. they were just three little cylinders that you would pull up and it would be a cup. It was, a, it was a really interesting, uh, and it was something that was in a box that he had 
uh, right right toward the end of the end of his life but i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure i recorded those conversations about how he how he had gotten those um i think it's so we didn't have to buy those uh well yeah, we and, but i mean i think did we tracked down some stuff though though didn't we uh for the yes yeah the the so-called wilson dollar yeah um which is not was not a dollar uh was never was never meant to be currency uh they were metals it's just it's one of the bronze ones and they made they made quite a few of them and then apparently didn't have any where to <laughs> no one wanted them uh because the the silver ones are kind of hard to find and there were only just like five of the gold ones made so they're like those are rare uh the one i have based and it, it there's a picture of it in in the video uh which is the damage to it makes me think that it probably is one that they they yeah, have been took in. off of the from the from that had been dumped in world war ii and that they they pulled it up with yeah the, i mean that's what i, was, I mean coins, coins can get damaged a lot of different ways but i was assuming the way yeah. that that looked at that was one of those that they'd they dumped in the harbor to try to keep it from the Japanese. Yeah, I don't know that I I don't know that I have like a like a direct record that says that they pulled it out of the water, but that that's what it looks like with that mm -hmm. damage. It looks like it was sitting sitting in the water for a while. Uh, it's not a particularly like good condition one, but I, I wasn't I wasn't looking for a mint condition of that. I think it's a cool a cool thing to have that was you know unique to that particular piece of history and that they opened it in 1920. Uh, I'm just about to read a, a Woodrow Wilson uh, biography, um, but probably it's not going to get a whole lot of mention there. It's a fairly small piece of his presidency, but I think it's an interesting piece because that's, I mean, that's what started them having a mint there, which they had for several years. And then it was closed and reopened. I think, I just think it's a really interesting, it's an interesting way to collect history and fairly inexpensive because i i'm not i'm not my whole collection is probably not worth not worth more more than a couple hundred dollars or something like that if i were to piece it out um i've been collecting those state quarters and then they've come up with a, a dozen new programs after that one for a long yeah, time yeah it's not, i don't know got all kinds of, you never know what's on the back of your quarter yeah these days. yeah i don't know that they'll ever be they'll ever be especially valuable um coins or not i don't know because people because they're one of the ones that you know people are specifically collecting them on the other hand you see a lot of them in circulation so i, I don't i don't know exactly what what that'll be like but it's not, it's not really the point uh, i enjoy collecting things i enjoy <laughs> and i enjoy the history connected to them so i think it's a cool piece I didn't really go into the details. I, I mean, I think numismatists can operate on pretty much any price yeah. range. Yeah, I didn't really go into the details in this. Uh, you, we could have written a whole episode on the Japanese uh, recovery of the coins. Yeah, uh, that they that they <laughs> it's threw just out another of interesting order. story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we we essentially just had to say uh, first they used Filipinos and then they used American divers. Uh, but I, I was I was reading some more on it again because I had remembered doing the research and I was like, ah, I didn't. I think it's a tell that story in this. Uh, it, it might be worth going back to because it's just an interesting. Uh, the Japanese knew exactly where they had dumped the coins. They thought it, they were all clever, where they had they had found these landmarks and they're like, ah, this is the X marks the spot. Uh, the Americans, they they uh, they had been told the the divers who had dumped them. They were like, don't tell them that you're divers because they'll they'll want to put you underwater and they get caught in the POW camp and immediately the Japanese come out come over and they're like. <laughs> you're a diver you're a diver you're a diver I knew exactly and then they brought him on this boat <laughs> exactly to to the x where they had dumped these things and so the the americans were like oh we were going to pretend we didn't know that there was any silver but you know they bring it to the exact spot you're like hmm. okay they might they might already know about the silver <laughs> uh that what they had learned is that the filipinos had were not trained divers. I mean, they were just using, you know, whoever they could, and they uh, died of the bends. Several of them oh. coming up, coming up out of the water, and they weren't using uh, good diving equipment either. So someone lost his helmet, and he it's just gone died and un drowned underwater i guess they never recovered his body uh so the the japanese figured out that they were only going to be able to get that silver out well the japanese army figured out the only way they were going to be able to get that silver out and give it as a gift to the emperor that came from them and not from you know the uh the the because the, the ijn the the navy had had divers, divers but they didn't want to use them because um, this was supposed to be the divers because this is a gift from the army. yeah <laughs> Wow. So and that, the, that could it, happen with the, the U.S. too. That really could, yeah. Yeah, the, this this jealousy between them. So the Americans, I mean, they just sabotaged it the whole way. Uh, one of the things that they did is they brought that silver into POW camps, and one of the reasons why the economy collapsed and they, that uh, invasion money was called Mickey Mouse money was because there was enough silver coming into the economy in Manila from these dudes who were stealing it out of the water uh, that it was it made the it was crashing the value of the of the uh, paper Japanese bills. Bill. Okay. 
Because <laughs> no one wants to accept a paper bill when they can we accept it. Did some of those Japanese yeah. bills too, though? I thought that we got some yes. too for the... I'm I'm pretty sure I do have some of some of those ones too. The paper paper money is in it's it's a little bit different. I have collected some of that. Uh, it doesn't survive as well as the coins, oh, yeah. so it, we 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 don't have as old. But I've got like I've got some silver certificates, uh, uh, silver dollars, and um, I've got a lot of ones from just that were just piles of uh, kind of world money. Uh, some of it I've identified, some of it I'm not 100% sure what it is. It's all kinds of just, di some of it's like fiat money that they were using for uh, uh, in POW camps and stuff like that. Some really, really interesting stuff though. It's another another piece that, you know, has some really interesting history. They they talk about there in the Philippines, they would go around with just like suitcases stuffed full of the things and you couldn't, you couldn't buy anything with it. You couldn't afford a, a loaf of bread uh, <laughs> with with your piles of Mickey Mouse money. Uh, one of, which is another piece of showing how difficult it is to run the economy of a country that you capture. Uh, the Japanese never really figured it out. That was that was actually true across the um, conquered empire. There's that the Japanese never really got the economy figured out in any of those countries. Uh, as the war went on, it was it was always chaos. And I think that's I think that's another interesting way to learn about history. And you know, this Manila Mint in particular is kind of emblematic and an example that we can use to talk about all these other places that were difficult. And in the modern age, just as much as, you know, in the 1800s when the Spanish were trying to run the Philippines from 2,500 miles away on the other side of the world. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, you know, it makes, it's again, an interesting piece of history. Uh, and yeah. because coinage, because currency is so important to that, uh, then, uh, then the, the history of the mint really tells a lot about the history of everything, yeah. social and not just economic, but social, military, everything that, that's describing what's going on at the time. It's interesting. I mean, all, all of it from every piece of it, from how we decide what to put, you know, who to put on these coins to, and that's not the kind of stuff we really talked about here, but there's, there's more stuff we could talk about. We could talk about mint marks, um, which we've been using uh, the ancient Greek city states were marking their stuff with mint marks. Uh, it's today we actually the the Philadelphia mint will not always uh, print all of the coins that say they are mint all the coins they say are from Philadelphia because they'll have say the West Point mint will make some but because they know if they put a W mint mark on those they get snatched up they they wouldn't oh, add anything and, and they the, would go into the into the currency because people would be grabbing yeah <laughs> they wouldn't go into circulation so uh, if if West Point uh, or San Francisco or another mint, you know, mints some stuff for circulation. They'll mint them with the uh, with the the other mint mark, which I think is kind of an interesting because because the the W mint mark alone is just a it's a collectible piece. Uh, yeah, that, that's you know it's interesting uh, because that's it's interesting how the 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 coin collecting hobby, numismatists, affect then the yeah. actual currency value of the of the coin, what you're doing with the coins. It's I, it's just another interesting wrinkle in what is very interesting history. Here. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.